Paul, welcome to Engaging Leader. Thanks, Jesse. It's good to be here. Paul, what's the gap that you identified that you're trying to fill with your new book? Uh, you know, the funny thing is that I've always been the, a, a good average bear for what HR people need because <laughs> I've been an HR person my whole career. And so the books that I've written, which, by the way, always almost always start with a number. I like number books. Oh. So my new one is a 75 ways. I've had a 96, a 101, blah, blah, blah. I like those kind of things. But the idea was I always try to write books that I would need myself. And so if it was a book on tough conversations, um, I wrote it down at a time when I was in one of those tough conversations. I'm one of those people who would make notes, usually go home and write it down six months later or nine months later and end up using it in some kind of book content. But I do refer to my own books. People laugh at me and they say, you highlight your own books. And I'm like, <laughs> I do. I do. The idea with this one was what I realized, Jesse, as an HR guy is I've never had a book to give to people who are newly hired managers or newly minted supervisors or for a manager who says, I want to get all my leaders on the same page. And I would give them, you know, those the classics out there, the good to great and the, and the you first break all the rules. And those are great books. But what they were not was leadership in the trenches. And I wanted to write a book that really taught people how to lead effectively. To me, it's always a, it's a muscle. You could strengthen the muscle. But a lot of times, companies don't really set expectations for their leaders in terms of how they want them to lead, both offensively and defensively. And so that was my thought. I said, I want to write a book that's going to set expectations for the managers. And the truth of the matter, too, Jesse, is I think a lot of times in corporate America, it's slimmed down a lot since 2008. A lot of management resources have been taken away. They used to have an IT help desk that's no longer available, or they used to have local HR that was a high-touch team that's now become a call center. You know, those changes are happening out there, and you've got to give them the tools so that they feel confident. They feel like someone has their back, and that was the purpose of writing the book. Yeah. Now, you first caught my attention with an article you wrote for SHRM. It was called, What All Senior HR Executives Wish Their Frontline Managers Knew About Effective Leadership. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, I'm the senior executive, not to point to my <laughs> age. But, but, but the idea would be everything that I've always done, I've enjoyed training. I've, been, I've enjoyed sitting with uh, new hires and talking to them about the company, but also about what the expectations are. And one of the best lessons I learned was from the general manager at Nickelodeon. I was the head of HR for Nickelodeon, and I loved that studio, and I loved SpongeBob, and it was just the right time in my life. But what Mark would do is Mark would sit down with new hires, and he would talk. He would have a meeting with every new hire class. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what he would do is he would meet separately with the leaders, and he would give them a short list, a one pager of Mark's rules, and he would say, "You guys, these are my top ten." But I need you to know in fairness that this is the standard I hold everyone to, and this is why we have such a great environment here at Nickelodeon. But I'm going to hold all of you to this, too, because I need you. You're the new members of leadership here, and you're going to be the ones who are the role models. So I want to make sure that you're all in, in, in sync with me and understand what my expectations are. That little micro lesson was what this book turned into. Yeah. Because yeah. the truth of the matter is when you have someone at that level who sits with newly hired managers, first of all, they're so impressed. But secondly, they, like, they get it from day number one. It's like, okay, this is what Mark wants, and this is the way I'm going to move, and that's the direction. And then the reality was, you know, this book could be one of those books. I thought when I pitched it to the American Management Association, to the publisher, I said, a lot of times companies want to give someone a book and say, hey, not, not the employee handbook, but I want you to read this book. I want you to read it in your first 30 days or your first 60 days. And my argument it's not like you have to agree with every seven, all 75 points that I make, Jesse, but you've got to have something to throw darts against. You've got to have like that board that says, okay, who are you relative to this concept? And do you understand what we mean by motivating and developing and what we expect in terms of your growing and hiring people? But do you also know how to protect the company and how to protect yourself when those situations occur too? In that article, and also you just referenced it, the you, they're the uh, these offensive and defensive methods. What what do you mean by those? Well, I, I, I think I try to put it in sports terms because most people I think can relate to it. <laughs> and you know, the idea would be, yes, the offensive piece. You have to hire them the right way. You want to build trust in a relationship, especially with millennials, which are typically your thirty-five year olds and younger. The, the establishing trust and rapport. That's really, really important in the pre-employment process. But you also have to know how to communicate, how to develop, how to recognize people. And I'm not saying you have to be the corporate cheerleader. It's not that. 
but that I would expect all managers who work in my company to treat people a certain way. And when you look at exit interviews and why people typically leave voluntarily, they'll usually say lack of communication, lack of recognition and appreciation are their top two reasons why they leave. So the reality becomes, this isn't impossible. You just have to create the culture that way. And I think people know that inherently. They know what to do. They just don't know how to do it. And so the idea of the book was to teach them the how. One of the books I had written was 101 Tough Conversations to Have with Employees. Same concept. I know you know you need to do this, but it's opening the conversation that's so difficult. So we wrote the book through 101 scenarios of pretty much commonplace things that happen in the workplace that you need to know how to address. Same thing if I go to the defensive side, Jesse, it, it feels the same way. It's like, you know, managers make mistakes. They're not bad people, but they're tough situations that they're put in. And they don't necessarily know how to handle them. And they can inadvertently step on a landmine that is set, by the, is set for them by an employee or by an employee who's being, a coach, being coached by an attorney. And the manager steps on it and boom, and they don't even know what happened to them. And the next thing they're like, they're in HR's office and they're on the sharp end of the investigation spear. And they don't understand how any of that happened. So my point in the book is leadership is a team sport. It is no longer like, I don't need anyone to help me manage. You know, it's not that. It's like, hey, you need to know how to use your resources. So again, there's something for everybody in the book. It's a good tool for HR to be able to give to the, to the newly hired managers. But for seasoned executives, senior leaders in a company, the C-suite, they also want to know that their managers are, are being held to a particular expectation and are performing at a certain level. So. On the topic of hiring great people, let's talk a little bit about reference checks. Uh, do you really do you b- believe in those? Are those still a valuable tool when you're when you're uh, assessing whether to hire a, a person? I would say oxygen. I would say that not checking references and hiring someone is like having a loose cannon on the deck of your ship because you have no idea what you're getting. And so what I hear again, I teach at UCLA Extension. I do different kinds of programs, and oh, it's illegal to check references. No, it's not. Well, no one will talk to you anyway. Yes, they will. Um, you know, those kinds of things. Right. And so I think, I think where your reality is, you just have to do it a little bit differently. Once again, it's not the what, it's the how. And the trick to this, just real quickly, is you put the candidate in the role of building the bridge back to the prior employers. So let's assume that you're talking to someone who's worked for three companies in the last 10 years. On their application, or if you don't have an application, you typically ask them, what was the name and title of your boss? And then at some point when you're ready to move towards the, hey, I think this is a finalist and I want to check references, you can talk to him and say, hey, Paul, let's talk about these three people who are your supervisors, your immediate supervisors, because what I'm going to ask you to do is call them and tell them that references are really important to us and ask them to vouch for you, basically, because I'm going to need to talk to them. Now, either they can call me if that's easier or just let me know their number and what's a good time to call and I'll give them a shout. But what I find is when you check references, you get really clear insights into whether the tale that the candidate is weaving is accurate or if it's faux. And again, for me, Jesse, the key is talking to supervisors. I don't need character references, peer references, subordinate references. I mean, unless it's at a certain level. You know, if it's a a CEO, I need subordinate references. But that's not the point. The point in general is... Um, make sure you're talking to their prior bosses. And, and if that person is no longer on the planet and cannot be found, hopefully they have performance reviews that they can share. Because I want to see strengths and weaknesses. I'm not interested in letters of recommendation or even the LinkedIn recommendations because they only have positive. I need something that shows both positive and negative. But I would never think of hiring someone without checking references. Hmm. To me, that, that's critical. What do you say when that employee or their company says, well, we only let you talk to HR. We don't let you talk to the supervisor. Yes, I'm with you. That's the very good, very good question. So the point is, usually that doesn't happen if the candidate opens the line of communication. Now, if I make a cold call and John Doe has not worked for this person for three and a half years, and I say I'm calling to check references on John Doe, they're sending me somewhere, but they're not talking to me. They know better. If you put John in the situation to say, oh, uh, Jesse, would you mind talking to Paul? I'm really interested in this job, and it was really exciting, and I'm, he's asking. Typically, if they, truthfully, if they like the person, they're going to help them out. <laughs> if they don't like the person, they're going to claim, you know, sorry, can't help, it's a, it's a policy. But the candidate will usually tell me that. 
So the candidate will say, Paul, you can reach out to Jesse, but I don't think he's going to take your call. So I kind of know it beforehand. And the final question, the final answer to your question, Jesse, is if, the, if I think I've got this set up the right way and the person still won't talk to me, you can challenge the stone wall. I've done this. I don't do it often, but sometimes I'd say, hey, Jesse, listen, um, I, I respect that and I don't want you to violate your company's policy. But the truth of the matter is I have to assume no news is bad news. So if you really don't have anything to say, I'm going to have to assume that you don't have anything positive to say. Now, if they say, no, 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 don't assume that. I know I like them, Paul. It's just a policy. I'm safe. If they say, well, okay. <laughs> then I know. Now, again, I'm not basing everything on one reference. But if I'm doing three references on average and I can't get anybody to talk to me, it's kind of a red flag for me. That would be a real concern. So I guess that's the way I would put it. Yeah, that's really helpful. I like that. So you, gen- if one of those, uh, if that was the only bad thing, bad thing uh, against the employee that the, the prior supervisor wouldn't open up. Um, you, you wouldn't necessarily hold it against them. But, but I like, I, I was going to say, assume that you were going to read between the lines that it was bad news. But I like that you basically put it on that prior supervisor. Like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read between the lines here and assume it's bad news. And, and you're just being right up front with them. Well, my style has always been very transparent. It, it's even like, you know, with the Tough Conversations book. It's like, look, don't make people guess. And I say it very respectfully, and, and I don't judge. It's just like, you know, I, and I don't, it usually doesn't come to that. I'd have to say eight times out of ten, the references go through without much of a problem. But occasionally, if I get a pushback, especially if it's like the second or third call where no one's willing to talk to me, in that circumstance, I may push back too. So again, I, I don't look at references or testing as an absolute knockout. I, I never have. But you have to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And what I found is strong employees typically are resume builders on the one hand, but they're also relationship maintainers. If you were a good employee, most companies will typically try and help you find something else. So I try and take advantage of that as the hiring manager. Yeah, that's helpful. Well, so the employees on, on board, and let's talk about the developing area. The, the, this, whole, this whole field of employee engagement, uh, there's lots of big consulting firms out there with surveys and, um, and processes, and I guess it all seems that regardless of what the survey says, it, 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 to a great extent it comes down to the, the, the actual manager, the supervisor for each employee is the biggest, has the biggest impact on engagement. So what's, how do you interpret surveys? What's your view on surveys and, and what actual managers can do? Yeah, it's a good question. There's a whole business around this and there's employee recognition software programs and you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're a big company very easily on putting these programs in place. And I think they're it, fundamentally, they're very healthy and they're good because employee recognition is really important. I think one of the reasons why we're seeing such a big uh, focus on it right now, Jesse, is because since 2008, employees have felt like they've been treading water in their careers. There's been nowhere to go. If you leave the company, you're going to be last in, first out, somewhere else. So there's a job security issue if you leave. But if you stay in the company, there hasn't been much in terms of merit increases or promotional opportunities or bonuses. And all of a sudden, like in the last year, two years, it's all changing. And, and what used to take 10 years for an economic cycle only takes two or three. Hmm. And now all of a sudden there's a tremendous demand. And if you talk to headhunters, they're like, good luck trying to find salespeople or IT people or finance people. So now companies are sitting back and all of a sudden it's not like you're lucky to work here. Now it's like, oh my gosh, we better make sure that our people are happy because we don't want them running out the door the next time a headhunter calls. So I think this, this is kind of natural that now we're looking at everything about retention and development and engagement. The idea of the surveys is they're helpful to a point. Nothing is absolute. You can spend $150,000 on a new software and put it in, and you can mandate that all your managers give you know, smiley faces to their employees. <laughs> but that's not necessarily going to change the culture of the organization. The surveys are good. There's still people out there that will always say, I'm afraid to take the survey because I'm afraid they can lick it back to me. Even if you use a third party, but there's a barcode, they freak out. I mean, <laughs> they get true absolute answers on that stuff. It's not a bad bellwether. It's good because it gives you a point in time. And so as long as you use it just for that, I think it's fine. The truth of the matter, though, and what I talk about in the book a lot is a lot of this stuff is personal. When you think about the glue that binds someone to a company, it's the relationship with their supervisor. 
It's that and it's the learning curve. I think people want to feel like they're learning, they're making a positive difference, and they're adding to their resume. So that's kind of what it's at, which tells me, though, that frontline managers need to know that it's not a software that's going to be a solution. And it's not a survey that's going to be a solution. And it's not an HR department that's going to be a solution. It has to be on every manager to, to develop those relationships. And, and the simple litmus test I give is think about your favorite boss. Who was that? How do you describe that person? And most people will tell you, it's, uh, you know, I know my favorite boss was Mark. He always had my back. He trusted me. He challenged me to do things I didn't even know I could do. Um, I loved working for him because he always made me feel like blah, 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 right? And my answer to that is what I'm describing is not what Mark did. I'm describing who Mark was. It's the, the, this concept that beingness trumps doingness. You don't have to worry about doing, doing, doing. They have a great book out there called A Thousand and One Ways to Motivate Employees. And it's a fabulous book. It's in a top seller for good reason. But it also misses the point. The point is when you think about who your best boss was, it's, you don't really describe through doing this. You described who they were and how they related to you. And that's as a leader where you have to assume responsibility. The motivation piece, I've always said, don't bring your cheerleader pom-poms to work. You don't need them. That's not even your job. Motivation is internal. You're not expected to motivate your people. But as a good leader, you are expected to create an environment where they can motivate themselves. And that comes from listening to them, and that comes from getting to know them, and that comes from giving them the, the freedom to kind of find the traction to be successful, whatever it looks like in their own way. It's like what we do with our kids, right? You send them to hockey, and then you want them to do volleyball, and then they do soccer, and then they do taekwondo, because you're hoping that something is going to click that they're going to enjoy, and you give them the broad exposure. In a lot of ways, we do the same things with our own employees, because we want to make sure that they have that flex and freedom a flexibility and freedom to find their own way to the solution and build their resume in the process. Yeah, well, that's good advice. You wrote a, books on goal setting and performance review feedback. And performance reviews and, and performance management in general has been in the news a lot lately with very large companies deciding, let's just get rid of yeah. them all together. <laughs> yeah. what's, what's your take on, on that trend? Yeah, no. I don't agree with it. And, and I'll tell you humbly why. When I look at the companies that are doing that, they're usually kind of the Silicon Valley, big, right? You're hiring all exempt employees who all went to top tier schools and we don't need those forms anymore and blah, 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 right? So I get right. it. Right. On the legal side, your defense lawyers who represent companies are going to say, you know what? You're not doing yourself any favors because you give someone a final written warning and then a month later you give them a performance review and you said they met expectations. So you shot all your documentation down and then when you fired the guy, you made the case worse. So there are a lot of arguments why it doesn't work. But fundamentally, think of the education paradigm. I think sometimes colleges say we want GPA. Sometimes they say we want uh, your uh, responsibilities in the community. Sometimes they want a leadership profile. Sometimes they're, they're looking at GPA plus SAT plus ACT. The point is it's okay if it changes. I think institutions have a right to change what they're measuring at any given time because that keeps it fresh. But the bottom line is performance review is nothing other than a report card or a scorecard. And when you read the books that say abolish them, it's like, okay, well, what do you replace them with? And they say, well, real-time feedback and monthly one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I'm like, well, that's not an and or. That's a both, uh, an either or. That's a both and. Mm -hmm. You should be doing those things. And it culminates in the report card at the end of the year. It doesn't mean like you get rid of the report card and do that instead because I'm not that naive. The bottom line is most managers are not going to give real-time feedback and have one-on-one -on -one monthly meetings. They'll do it for a few months and it's going to go by the wayside. So with all due respect, I like the fact just like with academia, that they like to change these things up. That's not a bad thing, but I don't think you can take away the scorecard slash report card slash annual review because it is a culmination and it does make it easier to move from there to setting goals for the next year and everything else. So I don't mean to be a naysayer. I think it's kind of a temporary phenomenon right now. So why is the whole performance management process, why does that tend to be demotivating to employees as well as to managers? because two reasons. Number one, it becomes too rote. Just like the idea of succession planning and talent management, it's a great idea. Companies should engage in it. But if it feels like HR is saying, okay, now on July the 15th, this is due. And on July the 30th, this is due. It takes the fun out of it because now you've just taken this really important thing, which is important for someone's self-development, 
and you've made it a mandatory task. And that happens in companies. You can't take that, that human element away from it, but I'm just saying, it, just looking at it objectively, that's one of the things I think takes away from it. The second thing, though, more importantly, is managers would rather stick needles in their eye than give feedback. <laughs> I always yeah. say that you know, the path of least resistance is avoidance. They're not going to do it. They're going to hope it fixes itself and blah, 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 until some proverbial straw is broken on the camel's back. And then, boom, now they will come into human resources, and that's it. They want the guy gone, and it's like, well, we'll slow down. Hold on. And so the, the performance review process is forcing managers to give information that they have not wanted to give all year long. And it's then they know they don't want to blindside the employee by giving them negative information or failing them on the review because then they don't get any merit increase and they're not eligible for promotion and et cetera, et cetera. So this great inflation creeps in, but it hurts the managers because they're not comfortable giving the info. And truthfully, the employees tend to be very, very... Uh, sensitive, overly sensitive about any kind of criticism. So you put it all together and you're forcing this annual meeting which nobody wants to go to. There are ways to fix that that are very simple. You just have to kind of change your sponsoring thought about the whole process and what really were, your role is as a manager and what role is what your role is as an employee. Well, tell us about some of those simple ways to fix that. Well, the first thing I would say is as an employee, never go into a performance review not knowing what's on that performance review. Whether your company tells you to do a self-review or even if it doesn't, you do a self-review. You give it to your boss two weeks before that review is due. You make sure you go through all your achievements, all your accomplishments, all your goals. And what you end up, what you end up doing is you remind the boss of a lot of things that happened over the past year that the boss forgot about. And number two, you put your boss in the role of mentor and coach. That's a much better position for the boss to be in than unilateral decision maker and disciplinarian. So I think the one thing I would say is as an employee, you, respond, you assume responsibility for the feedback that goes into your performance review. Makes your life a lot easier. Now switch over to the manager side. If the manager is setting this up the right way, fairly, um, honestly, I'm not saying they're giving feedback all the time, even monthly. But you should be having a meeting with your employees at least twice a year as a minimum. So you're covering no more than six months of, of, you know, since our last meeting six months ago. Truthfully, it should be about once a quarter. Most human beings would like to know that they're getting feedback, they're on track, and that they haven't veered off the path. The, the catch to the manager is don't hold their hands. I don't tell my people, well, we will have a meeting once a quarter. What I tell them is this, look, you guys. I want to have a meeting. We're going to have them twice a year, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm going to open it up to you. And if you would like to meet once a quarter, I'm going to ask you to put time on my calendar. And I'm going to ask you to prepare for that meeting so that you can kind of guide me in terms of where you've been and where you want to go. If you don't want to take advantage of it, you don't have to. But the reality is I would recommend you do because I'd like to have that kind of engagement with you. Most of them will respond to that positively and they'll do it. But notice, I'm not treating them like children. I'm treating them like adults. It's up to you. And you put the time on my calendar and you prepare and you educate me. So the problem with the performance review is I'm the writer trying to remember. I have eight different people who report to me. I'm supposed to remember which one did what and I can't. And, 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 and the burden is on me to put together all of this flowery stuff, which either I'm not a good writer or I'm just not in a good mood. When I wrote those 2,600 phrases books, it was really uh, what made me think about it was some, I'm a good writer. I hate writing performance reviews. And it's hard for me. Sometimes I'm just not in the mood, but you got to do it. So I wrote those books for myself in that sense. But I do think it makes it easier for the manager, Jesse, to be able to put the employees in charge and let them give the feedback. And it makes it easier. Even if you agree to disagree, it's okay. It still empowers your employees and they appreciate that. Oh, that's good advice. Thank you. When you're the manager and you've got to have that difficult conversation with the employee, you've got some negative feedback, what do you, how, what's your recommendation there in terms of approach? Good question. So here's the trick. What I tell everyone whenever I do my workshops and my webinars is I'm like, you guys, if you remember one thing, use the word perception. Perception is not right or wrong. It just is. It's kind of like feelings. Feelings aren't right or wrong. They just are. And they used to call them PR firms, and now they call them perception management firms. Everyone is responsible for their own perception management. The reason why I think you can enter into a conversation that way, Jesse, is because people don't feel like you're judging them. It's okay to observe. It's not okay to judge. It's okay for you to say, let me tell you what's so, 
it's not okay for you as a leader to tell me about the so what. Okay, the what so is okay. The so what makes people angry. So I think it's one of those things where if you sit with someone and say, um, Jesse, I, I wanted to talk to you because what happened in that meeting uh, just a little bit earlier, I don't, I don't quite get it. I, I don't know where that all came from, and I know you know what I'm referring to, but I have to tell you, as the leader in the group, I was really embarrassed. I, I was really, I felt like I was attacked a little bit, and that may not have been your intention, but from a perception standpoint, that's really what it felt like on my side. And now you can engage in a topic that is very uncomfortable to talk about because the bottom line is you're the boss and you're still going to put the shoe down, right? You, you still get to call this one. But if you open it up by welcoming the person, it's different than if you say, Jesse, you really got a bad attitude. I don't know if I ever told you that, but what happened in that room, Jesse, right? And so what happens, Jesse, is where it goes. When you use perception, you keep it objective. The truth is the, the, the emotion you want to trigger when you're dealing with people with negative information is not anger. Anger goes nowhere. Anger is external. If you make me angry, it's your fault, right? Um, the, the perception you are, the emotion you want to draw on, interestingly enough, and, and I'll explain, is guilt. And I don't mean guilt in the old-fashioned sense of making somebody, putting them down and making them feel, I'm not. But if you think of guilt as a transcendental emotion, it is. It makes people assume they look inward for partial responsibility. And as long as you can get them to some partial responsibility, you can fix the problem. So in my example, when I open it up and I'm like, I don't know what happened in there, but I really was kind of embarrassed and I, I, I felt a little demeaned. And I have to tell you, I respect you enough that I would have never done something like that to you in front of everybody else on the team. The natural human being emotion is going to be, oh my gosh, Paul, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. That wasn't my intention. Mm-hmm. Okay, now you can fix it. Because, uh, again, I don't judge, and it's like, listen, people sometimes write, but as long as I have a commitment, I usually end it with, okay, but Jesse, I want a commitment from you right now that we'll never have to have a conversation like this again because this is uncomfortable for me. Yes, Paul, it'll never happen again. Boom, you're done. There's no more, no corrective action, no drama. I don't like drama. So the reality is I think if you say it the right way to people and you open it up uh, in, in a way that they can listen objectively, because you know they're coming in, Jesse, and their body language is tight, right? They're right. closed. Why is he calling me into his office? Well, he deserved that. You know, blah, blah. That's where they're at. Now, you can either go head to head, anger to anger, and you've got a bad attitude. No, you've got a bad attitude, and you can start that whole thing. Or the reality is you can sit there and say, I don't know what happened, but I respect you too much to ever, to ever do something like that to you. And honestly, that really embarrassed me. It hurt my feelings. Now, you don't have to use those words. Some managers will say, I would never say that to an employee. Pick your words. The, it's not the wording. It's the structure. And I think when you come across that way, by the way, this works with teenagers too. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, <laughs> when you come across that way, people will listen, people will engage, and people will assume partial responsibility. And then you can fix it without a lot of drama. That's good. Well, we ha- have uh, time for one more topic, and then I want to be sure to ask people um, ask you about how people can find out more about you. But what what else would you pull from the book that you want to make sure that that our listeners have a chance to to dig into today? Well, I, there's always been this concept that I've called selfless leadership, and sometimes you know I think they coined it in the '70s. You know, servant leadership. It's an older idea, and and I don't mean to sound Pollyannish, but but what I've always found was. I've always had great success with my own teams. I, there's a social element to work that is wonderful. And, you know, when you can see and help people grow in their careers, whether it's with your company or elsewhere, the bottom line is there's nothing better than that. That's the greatest gift the workplace offers as far as I'm concerned. When you retire and they give you the watch, people from 30 years ago are going to come up to you and say, you, don't, you may not remember this. But you helped me so much, Jesse, because there was a point where I was blah, 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 blah. And you're like, wow, I didn't realize my life touched yours that way. That's the key to all of it, right? Yes, we want to build kingdoms and we want to make money. I get that. But it's how we touch people in the process that really is the, the most rewarding thing for most people that I know that they've said that they've enjoyed most. So the reality becomes the selfless leader, the, the way it shows itself is, is quickly, when you're in an interview, especially with a millennial, don't jump into the Q&A too quickly. The relationship isn't ready for that. You've got to build trust. You've got to build rapport. Talk to them about what criteria they're using in selecting another company. Why are they here today? What's going on at your current company? Why would a move, why would this move make, make sense for you in terms of building your career? 
And how can you explain this to a prospective employer five years from now? I mean, how does this fit into the whole puzzle? When you ask candidates questions like that, they're like, wow, I've never been asked this before. And it's a challenge. But at the same time, it's a positive challenge because they're going to walk away and they're going to say, you know what? If this company asks those kinds of questions of people before they're even hired, they must really think a lot about their people in terms of you know, putting their people's needs first. And what you're doing is you're taking the employee development paradigm and you're shifting it to the pre-employment process. You don't have to be here six months before we have these conversations. We want to talk to you in the first place. And, of course, it helps us understand if the person fits in longer term for the company, what the company needs. Same thing what I've always told my employees is, a quick example, I use a, a, what I call a quarterly, uh, an HR quarterly achievement calendar. Okay, it's a spreadsheet. It's no big deal, but it's on the share drive. And everyone gets their space on the team, and they get to put down what projects they're working on, where the progress is, and we get to celebrate when they, when they complete their, their goal. It's something that keeps everyone on the same page, but it creates a bullet mentality. And that's what I tell my people. I want you to think about bullets that you can add to your resume. I want you to think about bullets that you can add to your self-evaluation when it comes time to your annual performance review. And you'll find that what I would tell people is, you guys, if you want my help with your resume, I'm happy to help. I've done bajillions of resumes. <laughs> I'm going to help you with yours, I will, because I'm going to help you get ahead as much as you want to, either at this company or somewhere else. And at first, the new employees look at me like, are you crazy? Wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. And the answer is yes, it does. Because if you put people's needs ahead of your own in that sense, guess what? They don't leave because they can't find that kind of management anywhere else. Everyone's worked for a Looney Tune manager at some <laughs> point, and they know, well, do I want to leave working for Paul Falcone and go somewhere else where there's a risk that I could be last and first out, or I could be working for a manager who's much more selfish? I really like working for Paul. I really like our team. Guess what? I'm not going anywhere. Even though he's the first one to say, if, if it is something that I can help you do, we'll celebrate the success. There's no drama in this. It's really win-win for everybody. So that's really the way I look at it, Jesse. And knock on wood, it's worked well for me. And thank God with a lot of my books, they've reached that bestseller status. So, I, I mean, it's resonating out there. So Definitely. I can see why. It's very powerful. It's very I powerful. It. Thank you. Well, the book, again, is 75 Ways for Managers to Hire, Develop, and Keep Great Employees. Paul, you're available for keynote speaking and uh, for leadership development coaching. Where can folks find out more about your work and, and, uh, get, and also get their hands on your book? Funny you should ask, Jesse. That's a good question. <laughs> um, the book is available on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever fine books are sold, so you can always get that route. I also have a website, and it's basically my name with the initials HR. It's paulfalconehr.com. And I have a ton of free resources and downloads, PowerPoint. I, everything I've always done, I like to share. I'm a sharing kind of person. So people can uh, you know, go through my, uh, uh, the website and pull anything they want. Of course, LinkedIn and Twitter and those types of things, I'm available on that too. So thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Well, and you've been writing for years and years and have a lot of great ideas and tips to share. And you're very generous on your, on your website. So I definitely encourage people to check that out. And on Twitter, at, at where your, your handle is at, Paul Falcone HR. Uh, so lots of good stuff out there. Thank you. Well, Paul Falcone, thanks for joining us on Engaging Leader. Jesse, it was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show.